So you're on, Greg. Okay, I'm just clicking OK. All right. Aloha to our candidate, our directors, and our guests. I'm Greg Masekian, president of Kakua Council, and we want to welcome you to our second Kakua Council candidate forum for the 2024 election year. Today, we welcome Kin Koko Iwamoto, who is competing for State House District 25. The winner of this seat will represent the residents of Ala Moana, Kaka'ako, and downtown Honolulu. We invited the incumbent, Representative Scott Psyche, to join us, but he declined. We're looking forward to learning more about Kim and hearing her positions on many of the issues her district and Hawaii are facing. Lila Moore, the most recent president of the Kakua Council, current president emerita and a seasoned moderator for these forums will moderate today. I introduce Lila Moore, who will begin the candidate forum. Aloha and welcome everyone. Good to see you again, Kim Koko Iwamoto. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Lila Moore and today's moderator. First of all, unless you're recognized to speak, please keep yourself muted. The first question is not really a question, but Kim, please tell us about your background and experiences that qualify you to serve as a House representative. Thank, thank you so much. Um, can you hear me okay? There's a little bit of echo. Um, so um, thank you so much, Coco Council, for this opportunity uh, to, um, to share uh, a little bit about myself, as well as my, my um, positions on some of the issues and some of the solutions I have to concerns you're going to raise. And I just want to share with you also that um, since our first meeting um, many years ago in this forum, uh, I did become a lifetime member of Kapua Council, and I've I learned so much uh, in, in observing your your other online uh, Zoom meetings. And so, thank you so much for that resource. Uh, also, um, I and also I just want to also share with you that the the information I've been learning even through this like you you guys are using this platform in such an incredible way that your questions have really forced me to lean in and learn about um, the issues that you're raising and I so I want to admit that uh, four years ago when I first um, met with uh, Kokoa Council for this position um, I didn't know as much as I I do now and so. It was really a great invitation uh, to learn more and to join the, your advocacy efforts. So to answer, go back to your, your question or invitation to talk about why I'm qualified. Um, first of all, um, I care. I care deeply about our neighbors. Um, and I've been going um, door to door in our district, door to door and building to building in many cases. Um, you know, hearing about, you know, our neighbors' concerns as well as their hope for our district and our state. And they've shared with me quite a bit. Um, and I know we're gonna talk about the substance of those concerns through your questions. So I'm gonna save a little bit about that, but I just wanted to let you know what my process was like in, um, in arriving at some of the solutions um, that I'm gonna offer. Uh, I also want to um, share that, um, uh, I just blanked out, I'm so sorry. Um, but yes, I look forward to, to, this, to this opportunity to, and to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Kim Koko, I should apologize to you because this forum is going to be perhaps the most challenging forum of all the ones that we're doing because you're the sole speaker. And we have many more questions to ask of you than we have opportunities to ask other, other candidates. Anyway, let's start with the first question. Your opponent, Representative Scott Psyche, declined to join us today for this candidate forum. And from what we can read about, um, read, he's also declined other opportunities to meet you in other public forum. What do you, why do you think he declined? And can you tell us your opinion about election debates and fora for the public? Thank you. Well, I think what we know is that um, these kinds of forum where you can compare and contrast candidates is a, a vital part of our democratic process. You know, being able to um, hear, and it gives each candidate an opportunity to say and stand by their statements in front of the other person that they may be referring to, they may be referring to their history. And that's really, I think that, 
an important um, where you can see how the other person might respond, might rebut, um, you know, clarify. It really does hold the, the, the whoever is speaking those words to be more accountable to those words, right? Like I, there's a part of me that, and I will, I will address some of um, um, my opponents, um, you know, uh, shortcomings and, what, and which is part of the reason why I'm running. Uh, and it feels awkward to not be able to say it in front of him or say it to his face. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that's really important. And it says something about, um, you know, it gives me an opportunity to say, yes, I'm willing to stand up to my words in front of you. And I welcome you to respond. Uh, and to for the public, for voters to hear that kind of exchange is really important. Um, one, one debate or forum that you did probably did not read about is um, Hawaii um, the, um, PBS, PBS Hawaii's Insights did send a really clear invitation to me and uh, Scott Psyche inviting us to attend their uh, taping and they gave us a specific date. It was supposed to be on July 11th. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, July uh, 18th. Yes, it was supposed to be last night. <laughs> And, um, and so I marked it in my calendar. That was it. This is the first time in three years that they were going to do this. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, they, they once again let, let him, um, you know, uh, cut it off. And their reasoning was that um, I, they couldn't just have me because it wouldn't be a fair compare and contrast um, if they just had me. And I said, well, wait a minute. The ultimate compare and contrast is... Um, whether or not how we how we treat voters, how we treat viewers in terms of do we show up or not? This is a job interview. Could you imagine one of the candidates for a job not showing up to the interview? Um, and it, I think that would speak very clearly about how they feel how how they feel about um, standing up to the scrutiny. Because um, you know, there's a lot, and truthfully, quite frankly, there's a lot of reporters and a lot of uh, individuals who will not stand up to him because he is the Speaker of the House, and you know, he, it's very intimidating to call somebody out who's in who wields that much power, who has so many connections to the mayor, to the governor, to other high officials, you know. And so, for people to stand up to them, um, you know, it's some sometimes it's something that only an oppo opposing candidate can do. Uh, and so for that, for that, that's all I can speculate in terms of the why, um, you know, it's, uh, I wish he could, I wish he could speak for himself on that issue of why. Thank you very much. All right, the next question, uh, let's see if I can get it posted. One of the most pressing issues for the state is the lack of affordable housing. Act 39, formerly known as Senate Bill 3202, Increase the capacity for greater density in communities with qualified residential zoning. In your eyes, does this act address or exacerbate the problem of affordable housing? Hmm. Well, I, you know, uh, I would imagine, you know, there's a theory that having more, more units available to, you know, to, uh, that that having this more of it units would be would address the problem. Um, however, I think there's two issues with affordable housing of affordable housing, and two second is the affordability of affordable housing. You know, I mean, I so what we have now, and and we saw it with um, Holly Kukua, I think it's called. It's the the senior the building for seniors in downtown Honolulu, um, where they cannot they have been having such a hard time renting uh, units there um, because it's not actually that affordable, even though they're trying to uh, say that they're affordable. So I I don't know what the impact is. One of the things I did not like about this was I don't like when the state pushes. Uh, counties to act in a certain way. I feel like the counties have a better sense of what they can and cannot do. So I do support home rule in, in these, uh, when these issues come up, especially around protecting the environment. Um, that's a huge issue um, when the state, and partly is that it, the legislature being based in Honolulu, uh, there's a lot more influence of lobbyists 
right? And so it's easier to push those or corporate interests to push those buttons. Whereas the, on the county level, especially our neighbor islands, uh, it's uh, they're a little bit more um, connected to their communities in a way that um, a corporate lobbyist couldn't um, pierce uh, or influence as much. And so that's why I, I think it's important to defer to the counties when it comes to managing their, their, their land and, their, and making sure they protect their environment. So I, I don't know if I answered that question, but I do, I definitely want to talk more about affordable housing. And I imagine um, the other questions will deal with that, but specifically about this bill, um, I don't know if it's going to have a direct correlation because one of the things we have seen more ADUs come up, um, but truly really affordable housing. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Doug. Oh, hi. Uh, thanks for this. Uh, another affordable housing uh, question, but rent this time. In Hawaii, a landlord uh, can double the rent of a senior with a fixed income on 45 days notice. In some countries like Germany and Switzerland, uh, this is considered contrary to the public good and is illegal. They can't do that. What can be done to protect uh, renters here in Hawaii? Well, we could, like many other um, jurisdictions, we could have we could in implement or enact a um, rent control structure. Um, that is one one option. Um, we can also um, provide. Well, one of the other issues I think is um, is to offer. Well, the state of Hawaii used to offer Section Eight, um, state funded Section Eight, and that would meet up between the um, would fill in that gap between what the landlord feels their rent is worth and what the tenant can pay, um, and so. Right now, after 20, 2001, the state uh, pulled back on funding Section 8 and relied solely on the federal government for, for that funding. And so, yes, the state and the county administer Section 8, but it's all federal monies at this point. We have to return to Section to uh, funding state-funded Section 8 um, to fill in that gap. One of the and, and here's here's one of the issues and we're going to see this because of the of the insurance uh, skyrocketing insurance premiums that my rent went up. So, for instance, I rent from a, um, a, a condo owner and he definitely is passing on his tightened expenses on to me as a tenant. And I can see that happening even in affordable housing buildings. Um, so what are we going to do? So one of the issues that one of the solutions I see to this issue of Kapuna not being able to keep up with the rent demands or increasing rent demands is to collect an empty home surcharge um, from from people who keep their dwellings um, empty by choice. Uh, right now, Hawaii, 40 percent of Hawaii's private property is owned by out of state investors. And according to the 2020 census, we have more than 70,000, actually closer to 76,000 empty homes, empty dwellings that are habitable, but empty. Um, and so if we're able to collect a surcharge, the county would collect the empty homes tax and the state would collect an empty home surcharge. And the way you justify the surcharge is to say, hey, um, let's say if, if it's an empty home, an empty condo, you would look at everyone else in that condo building and you would say, well, all of these other residents who live there full time are spending this much in the, in the local community, in the local economy. They're going out buying groceries. They're getting, you know, um, you know, their haircuts. Uh, they're, you know, they're going to restaurants. Um, they're paying GEP and they're also creating jobs. And those people holding the jobs um, contribute to our state revenue by paying income tax. So GET and income tax, but because that unit's empty, we don't have that flow of revenue coming into our coffers. And so what's happening is these individuals are really uh, stunting our economy by keeping it vacant. Um, and so they should, we should be able to collect a surcharge based on that. And with these added funds, I hope we could offer 
um, Section 8, state-funded Section 8, to individuals who, where there is that um, that gap between the, mm. what the individual can afford to pay without going hungry. Because as, as you know, um, knowing that 28% of our um, of the residents of Hawaii pay more than fifty percent of their income already. That's twenty percent paying more than half their income on housing, um, and it's interesting. And that number actually lines up very closely to the fact that one in three households are food insecure. They don't know where they're gonna they're gonna be able to eat their next meal, um, and that's really frightening, right? And it's, so it just says that currently things are not sustainable and we could do a lot better. I mean, and all of this has happened because of our statewide policies around, um, you know, and our lack of our lack of leaning into solutions. And so that's why I, I want, I'm running and I want to change that. All right, this is our next question. It's posted on chat. While we continue to hear of wor workforce shortages, we also hear of increased poverty in our communities. Please provide your definition of poverty and what steps, if any, you'll take to address workforce shortages and poverty. Right. Thank you. So thank you. Um, so one, one measurement of poverty is if that family uh, had children enrolled in public schools, would they be eligible for free and reduced lunch? Um, and I actually brought this to um, HDEA, Hawaii Government Employees Association. I actually told them a couple years ago when I met with them to try to get their endorsement. And I really do use that as an opportunity to educate the members and the different department leaders about what their unions can do. Um, so I let them know, I said, hey, I looked at the civil beat, you know, they have that, um, they make they uh, make it available what every single county and state worker is earning. And I said, hey, you guys have union members whose kids would be eligible for free and reduced lunch. That's how little they're being paid. You guys need to do something about this. You're the largest union in the state. How can you allow your brothers and sisters to be getting such low wages? And in fact, when um, when the HGA then leveraged me running against the speaker. <laughs> To, to get the raises they needed. And Randy Pereira, the head, called me and said, hey, I just want to let you know, we're, we're picking up that slack. And I said, thank you so much. I'm so glad I made you aware of that and you acted on it. So that's one way that I try to make sure that more people are brought out of, of that kind of poverty. Um, another issue I fought on and, and we were able to leverage, again, the fact that I'm running against a, a very powerful person is getting um, us away from poverty wages and more to more in the direction of you know living wages by raising the minimum wage, which was stagnant for so long. Um, you know, back in 2020, um, my opponent um, before session started made this proclamation that we're not going to raise minimum wage, and I think he made that pronouncement in December, uh, January before session started. And I called my friends at the legislature. I said, hey, did you guys have a caucus about this? Um, and they said, no, he never checked in with us. And that made me so mad, which is why I ended up running in 2020. I'm like, this guy cannot, you know, unilaterally make these huge decisions on his own. This is about representational democracy. You know, there's 51 legislators. He should be checking in and say, hey, how are the people in your district? How are the people in your district doing? Do we need to raise the minimum wage? No, he met with the Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii, and, and this is all part of their plus statement, right? They met and said, oh, no, the business community doesn't, can't afford it. They don't want to, you know, pay, pay into, uh, they don't want to absorb this kind of ex uh, expense to make sure that people are rising out of poverty. Um, so that's another way that I, you know, help with that. Um, we have left a lot of food servers or tipped workers behind. We need to catch them up. Uh, in terms of getting rid of the tip um, punishment, the tip um, penalty, um, so that people can, everyone can get the wages that they deserve. I've been, so here's the funny thing. So I've been a food server, I've relied on tips. And, um, and you know, that's not always sustainable depending on how many tables you get. You might come away from a four hour ship with very little um, tips. And if, you know, they should be made, everyone should be able to pay their rent put food on their table um, and um, 
put some savings aside for um, for emergencies. Thank you. The next question is short, but it's a very big question. What do you see as the current challenges facing public education in our state? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I can write a whole doctoral thesis on this, but the bottom line is this. We need to fully fund quality public education in Hawaii. When I served on the Board of Education, I would I would be so frustrated because I would tell the Department of Education, hey, when you guys said give us your budget, because the budget that the department would come up with first goes to the Board of Ed and then they send it to the legislature. The legislature, they're the only ones funding public education. Like it's their job, it's their single job to raise revenue for government operations. And so every year they would say, oh, well, we're afraid because if we ask for the real true cost of quality education in Hawaii, the legislature is going to get mad at us because it's, they're going to be offended that we're asking for the true cost. And then they're going to line item things, oh, you know, that's going to hurt our operations that are really going to sabotage our operations. Um, uh, and so every, so that was very frustrating. And so, and I would, I would, literally tell them, I said, you cannot do the work of the oppressor. Like you cannot go, oh, I'm afraid they're going to do this. Therefore, I won't let them know what their true obligation is, you know? And so that's, um, uh, and then as, as, as you know, um, then because I would speak out so much on some of these issues, the legislature and other, other uh, board members as well, because we kept laying the financial responsibility at the feet of the legislature, because who else is raising revenue, right? Um, so it's their it's their primary responsibility. Um, and then that's why the legislature uh, determined that we needed an appointed board, and so that's what happened there. But you know, that's all you know when you're pushing hard enough on the right issues is when you get this kind of pushback. Um, but uh, so that's that's the key thing is is full funding for public education. And an another thing to note is that when new settlers come to Hawaii, um, families come and they move here for whatever reason, uh, they come from places where they're like, wow, when we pay the districts in our old home state, the districts that that cost this much that we're paying in rent or we bought a house and our house costs this much, those community, those equal kind of economic communities on the continent, their schools look like our private schools. Like it's kind of amazing how when they come here, they're like, I can't believe our rent is this much, or I can't believe our house costs this much, and this is the public school of aesthetics. Um, the the resources that teachers have access to, the extracurricular programming. Um, yeah, a lot of those are hurt. And then not only that, but because um, we have such a, a disproportionate um, amount of private schools here in Hawaii, um, you know, there becomes a two-tiered system where our public school teachers are, um, they have they have the, the challenge of, of educating the most diverse student population with the most broadest range of learning, with students with the broadest range of learning differences. Um, and I witnessed this personally, you know, I, my daughter has been at King Kahumana Elementary School uh, from first grade and she'll be entering fifth grade, her final year. She's really happy with her. She loves all of her teachers. Uh, and so she keeps, you know, um, saying how excited she is to go back. Uh, and that's wonderful. And the teachers are great. And that's why they deserve to, you know, the more skill sets you bring to a job, um, the higher your, you know, often are. And um, so when you're working with such a huge diversity of students, um, you know, that, you know, and you have to implement all of those skill sets, um, that's why they should be getting paid um, much more than they are today. Uh, and so, yeah, that's the issue. It's full, fuller funding for public education. And the same goes for our, our university system. I really want to challenge um, all the legislatures, especially the ones who've been there for like really long, for a long time to say, hey, when you were in the University of Hawaii system, what portion, like how much did tuition cost for you then? And are you, and why do you think it's okay for you to underfund our university system so that the students there now today have to pay a larger amount of their of their income on um, tuition and services. Okay, next question. You know, some of the members of the Commission to Improve 
standards of conduct. What do you think of the results of their efforts? What steps, if any, will you take to imbue ethics and address corruption in our legislature? Well, I think as uh, Civil Beat, you know, they have the Sunshine Board. Um, uh, they've been tracking, obviously, all of the work of the uh, the, of the Commission to Approve Standards of Conduct, and they they themselves. So the Civil Beat has actually said the the most important reforms were either watered down or ignored, uh, and yeah, they've done very little um, on on this issue. Again, um, you know the. Uh, the the chair is a, is a huge supporter of um of uh, you know my opponent and he I, I feel like he went easy <laughs> on him and I I love uh, Judge Foley and uh but you know there's there's this he didn't want to make him look bad you know and that's quite frankly why they didn't push harder and call him out more um again it's this go along to get along kind of thing of of just being grateful to be put in that position of power as chair of that commission, but did he use it to the fullest? Did he push as hard as he could have? Given what's at stake, right? The pay to play politics, um, you know, this climate of, you know, um, this autocratic leadership style where people are rewarded and punished um, that breeds corruption. Because if you're on the inside, if you're close to the center of power, then you can get away with so much more and no one's going to call you out. You know, no one's going to rat on you. And so, you know, you just, and then you just think you're untouchable. And so that's what happens. And again, it's the lack of representational democracy is what, that's what we're talking about. Um, the fact that, um, you know, they continue to allow um, uh, uh, family members of, of people who get government contracts to donate, the fact that they allow you know, companies like Navitech they, and, and the Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii's Military Affairs Council to get, to get over a million dollars in grant and aid, that's our money. Grant and aid is the people's money. They're giving it to these entities like Navitech and then those owners and their family members then give campaign contributions to the very legislators who gave them the grant and aid, who gave them our money. So we already have publicly financed you know, elections, but it's only reserved for those who are in power in leadership positions, right? They're taking, they're giving money to these uh, companies and these um, entities, and then their, their, their staff, their lobbyists, their consultants, their attorneys are then giving money back to legislators, the campaigns. Uh, and so, yes, we need to change all that. And we need to talk about that and expose that more. Uh, and that's what I want to do from the inside. I just think it's much more effective when you say shame, shame on us, everyone, if I if I do get elected, to say, why are we allowing this to continue happening? Uh, so I drafted the resolution that the Democratic Party of Hawaii adopted, um, which talked about, you know, um, using the Sunshine Law, changing the ethics, uh, and not exempting legislators from the ethics, certain parts of the ethics law, state ethics laws. So there's sunshine law, state ethics laws, and then all of the state rules, all of the rules for the Senate and the House, where they allow themselves to waive each other. There's no conflict. Uh, yes, there is a financial conflict, but they kind of make it up that there's, oh, no conflict. I mean, literally, it, they make it up. They make up that. And it should be the determination of the Ethics Commission. You know, um, we should make sure the Ethics Commission has enough funding and staffing to, you know, investigate legislators when there are conflicts. Um, and I think the point from the very beginning, the first question when I stumbled, I said, I forgot what I wanted to say. This is what I wanted to say. As a Board of Education member, I we operated under the Sunshine Law and we made a lot of hard decisions. Um, and, you know, very a lot of well thought out, um, data driven decisions, but we did it. We were able to operate under the Sunshine Law City, um, city and county of Honolulu operates under the Sunshine Law. The other counties across the state under operate under the Sunshine Law. It's possible we can do this. It's not going to kill the the system. Um, so so all of these changes, all of these tweaks can can be implemented. And finally, one of the other issues um, that speaks to uh, leadership at the House and the House right now is the fact that if you're in private practice as an attorney, 
you are um, you are controlled by the um, the, the um, client client attorney confidentiality. So you're not allowed to disclose who your clients are and what kind of work you do for them. So think about that. Imagine if you were speaker of the house and you're attorney in private practice uh, and somebody comes along and says, hey, you know, um, I we want to change the laws to help us do this. Like if you're a company uh, and you pay the, you pay the, the individual who is above Uh, leadership in the house as well as an attorney and you give them all this money and they and you they tell you how to do it and they might kill certain bills or get certain bills introduced at the ledge but you'll never know we'll never know the connection um it's because as an attorney you don't uh, so anyway there's there's that uh there's that thing that the Demo again the democratic party of hawaii adopted this and said hey legislative leaders pay attention you're all democrats Pay attention. We want you to operate like this, and they completely ignored the resolution that was adopted by the party itself and the party members at the state convention. And I just think that's shameful, and uh, that they won't even listen to their own party in in cleaning up their act. Uh, and so we definitely can do much better. Okay. The next question has to do with the legislature again. Can the legislature do anything to obligate each agency mandated to oversee, oversee said legislation be mandated to enforce that legislation? Oh, huh, interesting. Um, well, you know, there is, um, you know, a lot. What happens is, <laughs> this is one of the tricks. One of the tricks of the legislature, right? They do a lot of, um, uh, like. The shenanigans <laughs> so one of the things they do is they pass a law and then they don't fund that thing they just passed it's really an unfunded mandate right that they pass a law and then it goes psych we're not going to give you the money to do it and so then the department goes well we only have so much money we got to do this or we got to do this and so what happens is the department is is often forced to decide what um, they want to enforce and, and that's part of the problem, right? All these unfunded mandates. And that's the problem with having this, you know, um, so it's, it's again, it becomes a sleight of hand because on one hand, the legislature can look to feel really good about themselves, about protecting these citizens and protecting this environment, this part of our environment and protecting consumers. And then, but at the end of the day, they cut those line items in the budget and then they say, oops, okay, well, basically we passed a law, but we're not going to give you the funding to enforce it. And that's the, that's the challenge. And we have to be really clear with, um, with uh, you know, uh, with the state about, about what the costs are when we pass. And this is why it, one, of the, one of the huge examples of this is our, our need to criminalize so many things we just criminalize a lot of behavior in our state and then and then we you know ask the police department to enforce or we then we even like extend sentencing mandatory minimums but we don't give the prison system more money uh so you know all of this it's, it's just a, a cycle so when i worked with senator Casio's office we actually asked um, the public safety director said, anytime you see a law that extends sentencing and makes you hold on to, you know, an inmate longer, you need to say, this is how much it's going to cost. Do not pass this law unless you're going to, you know, and I think it would, if they knew that they couldn't fund a pet project, then they might be discouraged extending sentencing. Um, and, and, and extended sentences might not be the most effective way addressing a public safety problem, but gets a lot of hype in the media. It gets a lot of, you know, it's, um, it's it speaks to the common denominator of, um, of you know, an analysis on what the cost. And we could do a lot better job uh, regarding that as well. Okay, the next question is kind of multi-part. It's kind of long. So I'll try to read it carefully. The insurance industry has a heavy influence on the retention of medical professionals and now on home ownership. In the medical industry, capitation agreements force medical service providers, in other words, doctors, 
to accept lower and lower reimbursements, and many struggled to stay in business. In the condo world, we knew in advance that deteriorating, bu deteriorating buildings, increased legal disputes, and shortfalls and reserves adversely affected the cost of insurance. Now there's a debacle caused, the debacle caused by insufficient hurricane insurance. Please tell us what you know about these effects and what you would do if you're elected. Do you support 100% state regulation for all insurance types, including condominium Assur uh, association master policy insurance, mas master, master policy property insurance policy? Sorry about that. Yeah, that is a long and complicated thing. The issue is equally um, complicated. Um, as you may know, and and uh, Cocoa Council and View is a regulated industry. You cannot sell or provide insurance without first getting approval from the insurance commissioner, um, who is under the you know the Department of Commerce and Consumer uh, Affairs. And so um, there is there is that there there or there is that requirement. And so what happens though? What I see happening is that once again, because so there's this need to smaller government, uh, what we do is fund the staff to actually check the industry. So what, we're, what we do is we set up these individuals to face, uh, face you know, all of these corporate law, all of these executives are paid, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to fight for what they want. But we don't give us who should be the insurance commission and the insurance commissioner. We don't give equal, equal, equal resources to investigate the truth of what's being told. And they just, they're stuck believing them. There's, then they surround and then all of the, and then all the lobbyists go to all the lawmakers and they're all whispering the same thing. We can't do that. We can't. So it becomes this weird echo chamber created person entity who should be regulated you know so that what then there's not enough calling out and calling for an audit calling for open of these private entities or these quasi private entities because in fact like h since it profit right so it's 501c3 it enjoys uh different kinds of tax benefits um, and so it should be more, we should be able to see um, how they um, truly, what they can and cannot do, what they, instead of just hearing what they claim, they should definitely have proof and evidence. Um, we do that for, you know, the company when they want to raise their rates. Again, that's another regulated, that for young brothers, um, they're, you see, when young brothers want to increase their rates, they need to open up their books and, sh and show proof that they really do these increases. And it's just not a play to increase their profits or to um, you know, to give bigger bonuses to their the CEO or the ED of their organization. That's what we need to, to look at. Um, and yes, and so some of this kind of lack oversight on behalf of consumers, it's really and it resulted in policy that have caused doctors to not want to come to Hawaii or they want to retire or leave Hawaii um, because they can't make do. Um, so we definitely need to, um, and, and what's really interesting is the doctors that rely on, and, and Frank, HMSA is the largest. So when I mentioned it's because they're the, you know, the elephant, um, and so are there some physicians who are afraid of speaking out against, you know, what's happening because they're seeing maybe their, their uh, accounts receivables will start slowing down. Maybe things will get more complicated for them. Uh, maybe as many referrals. So yeah, there's definitely fear, um, you know, among, among the, the medical providing industry. And so that's one side. And then the other side you mentioned was condo insurance. Um, as you mentioned, yes, and so the the consumer advocates for companies have, you know, ascending alarm since like 2016. 
and, uh, and about like what about the about the financial crisis that's gonna that's hitting us today. Absolutely, um, consumer advocates were um, ignored and marginalized, and all of their solutions and um, you know all of the the amendments to the laws that they proposed all got ignored because. All the, the corporate lobbyists on behalf of the developers and the community association management companies and all of their attorneys and all, all giving money to the lawmakers to, you know, to err on the side, err on the, to err, make sure the laws are, the status quo is kept in place so that all that dysfunction, um, you know, would benefit um, those entities at the, at the expense of individual condo owners. That's why this election is so important. It's good. It's a referendum for condo owners in our district. And now more than half of the voters in our district own our condo owners. And uh, obviously the rest are, are renters, but um, so condo owners can change this election uh, to say, hey, you've ignored us. You've ignored, you know, changing the law to protect us. Um, we're going to vote. Um, we're going to vote with our, we're going to take action with our vote um, compared to all of the lobbyists who, you know, would get offer them, offer legislators money to their campaigns. Um, the vote really matters. The power is with the people who vote. And so that's why I, I'm running and that's why I'm. Uh, I think it's so important to to understand um, all of these issues, and I've been so grateful to Kukua Council for educating me about a, a lot of these issues. Um, I'm not a condo owner right now, but I have. Um, I have been in the past, um, but I've learned so much, especially about what's going on here in in with Hawaii's condo laws and the history of of um, inaction by by current leadership. All right, the next question is a long question, but it's about condos again. Um, the most common issue brought forward by condo owners is their inability to enforce their voting rights in their associations. With the metrics cited by DCCA on November 2nd, 2023, there's 8,923 registered homeowners associations made up of 243,863 dwellings housing perhaps as much as 40% of Hawaii's population. Would you introduce and promote a bill to confer normal, unrestricted voting rights onto the members to exercise within their own association elections? Right. Uh, and it's, it's, yes, yes, I would. And I think Stuart Yurchin from Civil Beat uh, raised this point that condos and, uh, and HOAs uh, Th those communities are almost like mini governments, right? And so where they kind of, rate, they, they issue taxes to the residents um, and, and the way they operate, uh, it, there's this kind of like a little mini city thing. And so voting should also be with that kind of one, one person, one vote, um, with that kind of preciousness for democracy within that system. Uh, and as as many man, as many of your, your cocoa council members know, and as many condo owners who belong to boards, the whole idea of proxy voting can be in, in completely um, hijacked by um, the community association management companies, who may have a really good relationship with the current board. Um, who made the decision to hire them. And so they may want, so the community association management company may want to use the resources available to them to make sure that this, uh, com that the current um, board members who are all condo owners are, are kept in power. And so they might make it harder um, through the proxy uh, by disqualifying certain proxies, by making sure that certain board members, sitting board members, have access to phone numbers and email addresses that other, um, that a challenger um, might not have access to, right? And so um, to, in terms of who else can be voting and whose proxy can be taken, and then how it's gonna be used to benefit the status quo. And, and then you get this cycle that continues and perpetuates 
And it's, that's really, um, uh, again, it's, it's, it's one of those situations where it's so clearly open to, uh, I, is it corruption? I don't know. Is it, you know, that kind of misuse and abuse of, of power and access to resources? Um, and it, of course, it doesn't happen in every situation, but, you know, where, but I pity the, the condo owners who are stuck in that situation who are trying to make change, but they threw the the actual through the laws and through the rules and their the bylaws, but they can't break through because of this proxy structure that will always perpetually benefit um, the the status quo board. Thank you. The next question is related. Will you support an ombudsman's office to address concerns within condominium associations? homeowners associations, and planned community associations. Absolutely. Um, right now, there's so many conflicts between condo owners and association members and going back and forth. A lot of these are based on ignorance of the law and the rules. Um, and if, the condo, if an abundance person can just say, hey, you guys aren't following the rules here. <laughs> just follow the rules and your problem will be solved. You know what I mean? Like you have telling the board member you have this fiduciary responsibility or, you know, uh, uh, you know, or, or, or relax or helping the individual condo owner understand that they actually don't have certain powers and that, that if they want certain powers or, or access, they need to change the law in order to get that. Um, but it, then at least it lets everyone know, you know, on, everyone's on the same equal footing. It's like a referee. Um, and that would save so much in costs, so much in, you know, drawn out conflict that only oftentimes benefits uh, attorneys who are hired by by uh, condo boards. And um, and it really, again, it goes to the dis to the uh, disadvantage of condo owners who are individually paying for some of this through their share of uh, their maintenance fees or to the individual condo owner who's, you know, calling something out that should be done correctly. And because they're the one calling the issue out that's not being done correctly, that they get stuck with the attorney's fees. Uh, and so, yeah, there's definitely an ombudsperson would definitely help um, do a lot more, uh, uh, would go a long way. It'd be absolutely worth the investment of having that person in that office um, take a more active role in resolving and avoiding disputes. Thank you. Now, the next two questions are yours, but can you pick one of the two to ask because of time limitations? Sure. Um, I'll ask one that uh, touches on a subject hasn't been asked yet, and that's on uh, ceded lands. Um, the the um, use of uh, ceded crown lands came up uh, before in the Mauna Kea TMT issue, but it's now resurfaced uh, here on Oahu on the issue of the renewal of uh, 6,000 acres of uh, military leases in Kahuku, uh, Kavailua, Poamoho, and, uh, and uh, Makua. Um, what is your position on the renewal of these military leases? Yes, so I uh, was working with Senator Acasio's office, uh, Senator Acasio from Hilo, uh, as her office clerk, and she and we drafted together the um, uh, this. It's called a, a good land lease in good standing, where you're a, or a tenant in good standing to make sure that whether you're military or Monsanto or any other entity that you're in good standing. Your leases that you have, they're not going to be renewed, extended. You're not going to get new leases unless you unless you have certified or, or it's, uh, that it's been certified by the governor that you are a tenant in good standing, which means there's sort of several parts. One is that you fulfilled any MO, MOA, MOU uh, to clean up any toxic spills, any kind of um, rubbish, or any kind of, you know, unexploded ordinances that you, you cleaned it up, you've left the place better uh, then you found it, uh, or at least just as safe and as clean, not polluted. You cleaned up your mess. You've cleaned up after yourself. And then secondly, that you've not violated any laws in, um, in your use of that state or ceded lands. 
Uh, and then finally, um, you're not in arrears, uh, meaning you are fully paid up on all of your other existing leases. Uh, and so this kind of, um, this would help, I think this would go a long ways. And of course it was, it was, killed by somebody the only person who spoke out against this bill was the chamber of commerce of hawaii and this bill was killed by um the the spouse of one of the chamber officers um who was chair of the committee and it just disappeared the bill um that would have protected um all of the state of hawaii but specifically these lands from um further um further abuse and dereliction and so you know, that's to me, that's a common sense uh, fix. Like we shouldn't, who, what, what landlord would give another lease to somebody who's left it really horribly, who's, I mean, who's used it to uh, conduct criminal acts and who is not paying the rent um, or market rent. Um, so, yeah, so that's one of the issues that we could do better on. And I've been part of that, the pro um, solving that problem. Thank you. All right. The next question. Um, while the recently enacted Tax Cut Act 46, formerly known as House Bill 2404, the tax cuts were touted to be historic. Many opine that these tax cuts are only election year kabuki and that the state must reverse or revise these tax next year after the elections to ensure that we have enough revenues. What are your thoughts? Yes. Um, so I did speak to an individual who who did get um, my opponent to admit that they'll have to make adjustments <laughs> to these historic tax cuts because in, and then he admitted this after she confronted him uh, and she's a government uh, she's a retired government worker so she goes how well, there's twenty eight billion dollars in unfunded liabilities how are you giving you know all of these tax cuts and, and a majority of the tax cuts over the eight years will go to um, the wealthiest half of our state. And so she's like, how can you do that? Um, we, you know, you ever, and then that's when he admitted that we'll have to tweak, we're gonna have to tweak and make some adjustments to this, uh, this, current, um, this current bill. And so basically, yeah. And then also the fact that a lot of the government employee unions are all applauding it and endorsing all the legislative leaders. I mean, when, when you know, how do we pay for government employee salaries but through our taxes? They would, if Lingo tried to do this or any, they, they would have been up in arms. But because they got the nod and the wink from legislative leadership, that don't worry, we're going to restore those tax cuts. So, yes, that's the kabuki, that's the theater of, of how this works. And it's insulting to voters, it's so insulting. Um, and one of the issues that they brought up is um, this, this uh, one of the constituents in our district brought up was like, hey, why are you giving all these tax cuts to families who are households that are earning more than $400,000? They're not the ones hurting. Uh, and so, yes, it's absolutely true. So I hope that when these, you know, when, when these tax cuts are restored, uh, that they start with the top, with the highest income households, because currently even under this kabuki, um, tax, historic tax, tax cut, still, the, you know, we still have a regressive tax system where the wealthiest households are still paying less um, of their income, a smaller percentage of their income on the state taxes than the lowest half um, pay. And that's got to stop. I mean, the, you know, our low, lowest income earners cannot keep carrying the weight of, of operating our government um, and letting letting the wealthiest um, get these cuts and, and wealthiest you know, people live in our district actually. And no, none of them have said, oh, I'm so grateful for these tax cuts. They were truly what they want. They want more resources invested in addressing homelessness, making sure that, you know, there are services and, and social workers. They want sidewalks. They want crosswalks that blink so people can see when there's somebody in their crosswalk. There's all of these services and um, purchases that citizens, wealthy citizens want. They don't want the tax cuts. They want a better, um, they want more and better delivery of government services and we should give that to them. 
Well, Kim Coco, thank you very much. You took a barrage of questions from us. I'd like to give you a few minutes to make your closing statement to address things that maybe you wanted to um, add to that you said earlier. And after you speak, uh, where is Greg? Coco Council President Greg Misaki will give a closing statement. So it's your, your closing statement, Kim Coco. Well, th thank you, Lila and Greg and the rest of the Coco Council members for giving me this opportunity to speak directly to you and to the viewers and voters of Ala Moana, Kaka'ako, and downtown Honolulu. Um, I would be so incredibly honored to be given the opportunity to represent you, to represent your concerns and your hopes for our district and our state and not the interests of corporate lobbyists, right? I wanna make sure I, enjoy, I represent you. And the only way I can do that is by speaking to you directly and making myself available to you and taking your calls and going to, your, going to you to meet you where you're at. And I look forward to continuing to do that I've been doing that for the last four years and I really do love, I love interacting with my neighbors and I love campaigning because truly this campaigning allows me to go up to a stranger and say, how can I help you? It might be weird if some stranger did that, right? But because I'm a candidate um, and because I have a little bit of credibility as somebody who's a known and vetted candidate and a former office holder, I can do that and I can actually connect people to services. And I love that part of campaigning. So I haven't minded campaigning against uh, my opponent. I love it and I welcome it. Um, and I'll continue to, to serve the, the community with that kind of rigor and passion and, and compassion. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kim Coco. All right, Greg, it's yours. Thank you very much, Lila, for moderating. And thank you, Kim, for participating. So Kakua Council wants to thank Kim uh, for joining us today. And we wish you very well in your campaigning. Do you want to say democracy works best when all candidates join together in debates and forums? But we were very happy to have Kim here today a la carte. So we thank her for joining us. I also want to thank our directors and for their work and you know for the, the efforts to organize this forum. We've got quite a few of these that we're going to be doing through the election cycle. And again, for Lila for moderating and uh, being our host today. So thank you, everybody. Mahalo. I wish everyone well in the rest of their day. And again, to Kim and her campaigning. Mahalo. Thank you, Greg.